Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. The power of currency is almost as important as where it's placed. For decades, the Carolinas have built from within, moved goods around, and watched jobs grow, then go overseas. But recently, the winds have shifted and we're riding more tailwinds than facing strong headwinds. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to the most widely watched program on Carolina business and public policy. I'm Dr. Cheryl Richards, filling in for Chris William, and our conversation today is worth its weight in gold. At the intersection of a strong economy are solid foundations, business-friendly legislation, and of course, the glue is human capital. Our guests today discuss trade in the Carolinas. It's the power of partnerships, the pen, and the people. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded August 16th, 2013. On this week's program, Chris Bernay of Vapor Apparel, Ronnie Bryant of the Charlotte Regional Partnership, Jeff Miles of the North Carolina Ports Authority, and Clark Thompson of the South Carolina Department of Commerce. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining our conversation today. Thank you. I've had a few tongue twisters to get us started right. in this. Um, so let's talk about some of the changing policies and the people and the pen and its impact on uh, our trade in the Carolinas. We'll start maybe talking about um, not offshoring, but onshoring and what that means to us. Chris, you want to get us kicked off? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, uh, on behalf of myself and my partner Jackson Burnett, the rest of the team at Vapor, thank you for having us on again. Uh, the last time we were here, we were waiting on the Colombian Free Trade Agreement. Obviously, it went through or you wouldn't have had us back. So uh, <laughs> we think that it was a great victory for free trade. It's had a significant impact on our business, but I believe it's had an impact that's very positive on all of South Carolina. We were talking earlier about trade missions going down to Colombia, and uh, there's just a real big opportunity there. For us, it's created a lot of jobs and a lot of new made in the USA products. That's correct. Um, yes, the, <clears throat> the Columbia issue that you were talking about, we waited for quite a while for that free trade agreement to finally get passed. And um, we, we see the result. And you're being able to import product there and make items here. Um, it's been very important. But also, it gives uh, South Carolina companies and US companies overall the opportunity to sell their product in Colombia with no tax. And we think that's an economically wise decision. I mean, we're bringing jobs in, right, as opposed mm -hmm. to offshoring jobs. So that's a good thing. It but is. what other tax policies are out there that are going to hinder this ability to continue growing? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, we're, we're thrilled with the scenario as it is. Um, one of the ironies of the trade legislation we were working under prior is uh, we were working under what's called APDEA. And duty-free, our T-shirts, completed garments were, but our bulk fabric was not. So we were paying a, a duty on our bulk fabric, which could have actually caused jobs in the United States. So with the change, uh, the, the ratification of it by Congress, we were then, uh, re that, that burden was removed from us. And it really served as a linchpin for the third part of our business plan, uh, which was we wanted to make a Made in the USA line that was focused on digital print technologies, uh, mass customization and a quality performance fabric. Uh, since the time it, it, it began, we uh, added 20 jobs 
and that's in one year for a relatively small company. Five of those jobs are within our organization, and another 15 are up here in North Carolina. So uh, it's happening, and uh, we're, we're going up against Pakistan, we're going up against China, and uh, for the upper third of the market, we're going to win, uh, mm -hmm. where value is more important. I don't think that will happen for denim or flannel shirts. It's hard to create a lot of value in something that's not mass customized. So there's a lot of technology in our business, and it's not indicative of typical apparel. So Jeff, let me come over to you because you know I think products, goods, and services are you know the mainstay of, of our economies. But getting those around, importing those and exporting those are a key to the, the successful distribution system. So we've had a little bit of tension in the system with some logistics and distribution. From your vantage point, where do you think that we need to be setting our sights next to continue to um, sustain this growth? Well, I think in the context of the trend you've noted on, on nearshoring or onshoring, um, <coughs> there are benefits uh, that uh, accrue to balancing trade a bit more by making it a, an environment that sustains and facilitates more exports. Uh, we get a more balanced flow, and that makes for greater efficiency in the supply chain, first of all. Um, and it seems to be also in a particularly localized sense, it helps the North Carolina ports uh, compete more effectively for trade in the apparel business and elsewhere if the supply chains are more north and south between here and the Caribbean and South America versus the big east-west trades that are long haul coming from Asia and, uh, and the uh, near uh, Asian peninsulas. And how is the intermodal facility going to help us here? Well, the intermodal facility is um, uh, something that makes a market reach more economically viable or market size more economically viable. Uh, North Carolina ports uh, and, and the, the South Atlantic region more broadly have um, take great benefit from having an intermodal system that's viable and efficient in that it, it helps us reach those big inland markets like Atlanta, like Chicago, like um, Kansas City or Cincinnati and up in, into those areas. And, and so uh, as more trade flows through there, those systems like to have a concentration, a density of flow. So anything that's happening on, a, on an origin and destination level, whether it's trade policy or uh, uh, legislative actions that concentrates more trade through these portals will uh, accrue to the benefit of, of the intermodal system as well. The I would like to follow up on Jeff relative to the, the intermodal facility that's being now con constructed at the, nearing completion, really, at Charlotte International Airport. Um, the, the integration of, of barge, truck, rail, and air, uh, commercial air cargo service that will happen there at that particular facility truly positions the, the Charlotte region and this portion of North Carolina as truly a logistics center and truly enhances our ability to be more aggressive as we attract more foreign direct investment, as we facilitate more export. Also, but from a domestic perspective, making Charlotte a true distribution center, which will attract more domestic um, manufacturing and distribution opportunity. I also want to put a plug in, you were, you were talking about the aspects of policy, but I think we, we need to keep in mind, too, the uh, foreign trade zone, which federal program that our organization administers foreign trade zone number 57, which is in our region, and truly gives companies that are engaged either in exporting or manufacturing at international firms engaged in manufacturing and shipping offshore um, an, an opportunity to participate in duty deferral or you know tariff re reduction, um, and and gives us an opportunity to, again to have one more tool that will make us attractive to to companies that are interested in entering into this market, which leads me into the third piece, which is our foreign direct investment piece. So I think when you when you think about international business engagement, you one piece is, is onshoring, one piece is offshoring, another piece is export. And then the final piece is foreign direct investment. And, and what we've been able to do is, is develop a comprehensive program of international business development activity, which encompasses all of these. And you couldn't do that without the infrastructure in place to support very, it. Very much so. Yeah, we we have to have the transportation infrastructure, the rail infrastructure, et cetera. And if you, if you think about one of our true strength in this region is our geographical positioning. And the fact that 
that we have access to several major ports, including the, the ports in North Carolina, but the port of Charleston, and also we even we even market the port of, of Norfolk as a, a true asset in, in helping us be more competitive. So let's talk, let's take this, <coughs> talking about infrastructure and the growth of jobs. So where is the intersection of this connectivity between infrastructure, transportation, and technology? Well, I guess if, when you look at the, the infrastructure <coughs> question, we've just wrestled with this in South Carolina in our past General Assembly session where I think I think it was a um, billion dollars put towards road repair, um, bridge mm -hmm. repair, which of course is a small part of what's mm -hmm. needed because over the years we've had tough times and money has not been put really towards that. So we're, we're finally seeing a commitment um, by the governor, by the legislature to put money towards towards those repairs. And you have to have good roads to get product to the ports. And so from infrastructure standpoint, we're starting in that direction. And um, I believe it's a billion per year over the next 10 years. I think on the North State, just to add to that, there's, there are a couple of key initiatives uh, being spearheaded by the North Carolina Department of Transportation. And the first is just the restructuring. Of, of the leadership of the uh, the various logistics assets and infrastructure within the state. North Carolina Ports Authority very recently has been moved into an alliance uh, reporting relationship with the North Carolina Department of Transportation as a way of sort of getting all of our logistics development activities aligned and, and, and focused in the right direction. Um, and the second thing is the, 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 the important change that's been uh, uh, initiated and, and taken forward this uh, strategic mobility funding mechanism will help get the money where it's it's got the most leverage where where the most benefit from the spend will come so I think that that goes to uh, getting the most bang for your buck on your infrastructure spend and having it targeted right uh, to the logistics uh, industry who would be the end user of these resources. We've talked a lot about you know the physical infrastructure of cities, but I know you've put some infrastructure and technology in yes. your business. You know how does that play into this? Well, just real quick to follow up on your in, your, your nearshoring comment, uh, one of the things that we've really leveraged successfully here in the last two quarters is we we now do a weekly air freight out of Bogota to Charleston. Um, you don't want to do that if you're sourcing out of Asia. It can get really expensive, expensive yeah. really fast. So that's allowed us to right size our inventory. It's about it's it's made our inventory more uh, appropriate to the business that's happening on a on a rapid basis. Uh, with regards to technology, uh, you know we're really I, I argue consistently with people that I'm not really in the apparel business. Um, we're in the mass customization and digital print technology business. Uh, you know, the top third of our market, uh, people are not buying clothing from us. They're buying mass customization. They want names and numbers, and, and they want full-color sponsor logos on paintball jerseys and, and other athletic uh, garments that we work for. The Boy Scouts do similar things with us. But if you're going to develop a effective onshoring strategy as a manufacturer in the United States, you have to automate. Uh, so we've automated and we are, our biggest investment going forward over the next 12 months will be, frankly, you know, six figures on, on up into eliminating uh, bottlenecks in the way our graphics are processed and just in, enhancing the flow uh, of the process. Often we're stuck in art with too much stuff. It's like, wait a minute, we've got people to keep busy back here. So automating all that is critical. So suffice to say, the business of manufacturing has changed. Yes. So, so let me go to the next component of economic development, which is the jobs mm -hmm. and the people to fill those <coughs> jobs. So now we're, we're moving into the education space of having the appropriate workers trained with those skills. And, and from your vantage point in South Carolina, North Carolina, where do you see some great opportunities for us to grow that workforce? Well, of course, <clears throat> as you may have heard, my boss, Secretary Bobby Hitt, talked several times, a workforce development is our Achilles heel and it is for South Carolina and really for for most other states mm -hmm. where will that be down the road so I think from South Carolina's perspective we've we've put a lot of support a lot of uh, uh, energy into our, our Ready SC program which most states have that, that, that uh, train workers for companies that are coming in to the state um, but our apprenticeship program that they have um, the apprenticeship program um, I believe is uh, grown about 500% the last few years. Um, we're a work-ready state. 
I think there are uh, uh, 185,000, oh, was it, um, can't remember the exact number, 100, 185,000 people are qualified for work ready, meaning um, work keys. Mm -hmm. So the, the students are being prepared way ahead of graduation for careers in manufacturing and other things like Let that. Let me ask you, Ronnie, because you get to sell what he just said, <laughs> right? So is yeah. that really true? I, well, that's true, and I, I really, let me back up a step. I think his comments are very true, but, but let, let's set the stage here. We, we talk about technology and, and the, the type of skills that are needed within a manufacturing environment, and we, we want to grow that manufacturing base, but we, for, for, for decades, our economic development strategy has been based on the quantity of jobs. And, but within a manufacturing envir environment, quality uh, can be more prominent than quantity. Yeah. And for example, it's not unusual for a manufacturing facility to announce a $60 million expansion, which might require a 20% reduction in workforce because of the technology that's being employed in the process itself. So that's changed some thinking or rethinking for us in the economic development environment. So. If there is a shortage or if there is a challenge, from my perspective, in the continuing to restore the, the manufacturing critical mass, not only in our region but nationally, it's how do we address the workforce issue and shortage thereof. We in this country, at least from my perspective, do not respect the, the quality of what, it, what are really sustainable jobs within a manufacturing environment. And, and in Europe, they do a very good job of, of quote unquote, tracking yeah. students um, at 13, 14, 15 years old. And they get good students into a quote unquote, blue collar environment. But we still have that, that dirty manufacturing, um, low wages, uh, back breaking labor attitude towards manufacturing in this country, which is so very untrue. Yeah. It's very but, untrue. But how do we, how do we get parents and others to expose our young people to these uh, opportunities at an early age? And and you even know in, in your academic environment you have, you have, um, four year degreed individuals going back to community college to get a certificate to work at a manufacturing facility, and so we have to move the needle in that regards and and remove that image of a manufacturing job being a dirty job. And some manufacturing facilities are, are cleaner than my office. It tells you a lot about my <laughs> office, but, but they truly are. And, and truly, it's a long-term mental readjustment of long the population. Mental, and it starts, in all honesty, it starts with parents, too. So the manufacturing but, industry needs to get its swagger back. Is that what you're saying? Very right? much so, and I think we in the public policy arena need to be part of that educational process. There's another area that needs to get some educational education too, or attention to, and, and not only is it manufacturing, but you've got to have a, a, a trained workforce that knows how to manage these long and complex supply chains. So there needs to be mm -hmm. educational focus on logisticians, the next mm -hmm. generation of mm -hmm. them. Absolutely. <clears throat> so we talk about um, you know making manufacturing sexy, right? Yeah. You're absolutely right. You mm -hmm. see parents who are influencing their children's decision, which influences who you can hire and the skills that they have that they're bringing to the table. And we have a unique skill set. I've I've watched very enviously how the system has worked to educate employees for Boeing, and you see that at the community college level in in, in the Low Country. And uh, I'm a, I'm an enormous advocate of that. Uh, we typically, we are in a very unique type of business, and so we end up training our, our own people. Um, it's, it's tough to get hired. We, we, you ha everybody has to sign off on a new employee within our organization. Some of the organizations we've been effectively working with is we've had interns with uh, my alma mater, Clemson University. The, the graphics uh, college up there is nationally ranked. Those interns come in and they really contribute effectively quickly. Uh, it, you're right about logistics. Uh, our, our, even though we're near shore, it is still a complex process, especially when you're taking those pieces and reassembling them and manufacturing them here. So uh, y y it's, it's hard to find good people. 
um, I, I look forward to it getting easier. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Yeah. I think we all do. And there, you know, there's a component that you've talked about, Chris, which is the advanced manufacturing and the technology skills that are there, but also this business readiness. And so teaching people the business of business mm -hmm. and how to do imports and exports in a smart way, how to move goods and services across borders. So what kind of wisdom do you bring from your vantage points as you sit uh, and you look at this complex problem that we're facing in our nation right now? How do you impart your wisdom as we move forward? I tell them to pretend it's their money. Great. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that seems to focus their minds and, 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 and bring forth a, a level of creativity that uh, a whole lot of words can't. So then uh, let's talk about money. Let's talk about currency manipulation. What's going on there? How do you explain that? I don't. <laughs> I, I contend with it uh, on a on a on a daily basis. You know, we were talking earlier, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're going up against. I was just out at the Imprinted Sportswear Show in Las Vegas, and uh, we introduced our new Made in the USA product officially. We've been running it for a year now, but we thought it would be a novel approach to actually know what we're doing before we went to market. Uh, I was dealing with several manu uh, brands who were suffering from. Uh, offshore fatigue is what I call it. There was one gentleman I was on the phone with yesterday. He, it's 1,500 units of product a month, which is healthy business. I mean, we're talking about a sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar a month program. That's that's real money with real margin. He had been in China for two years, and then things shifted. Uh, minimum order quantity started going up. Samples weren't free anymore. And then there was a wholesale adjustment in the people actually making his product. Then he went to Pakistan, where he was successful a couple of years. Then he went to Mexico after that one failed. And he had told me several years ago, Chris, I'll never, I'll never be making my stuff in the States. I think you're crazy mm -hmm. for your plan. And then yesterday he said, I'm sending you samples. And, <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's going to be 16% more. And he said, you know, that's okay. You speak English. You're in my time zone. There's a lot of intrinsic value associated with that. And, and, and we're looking for partners. We, we don't want a big order and then nothing. We want to have a steady Freddie type business, which is why we've been successful with po folks like the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, one of our uh, large strategic partners and customers is uh, Frank Hintz with American Backcountry up in Asheville. He appreciates the green factor of our manufacturing. You know, we're in a LEED certified building. Colombia is one of the 25 greenest countries on the planet. Uh, this will knock you out. 70% of Colombia's energy supply is non-carbon renewable energy. So we're green at a lot of levels. And in certain markets, you get credit for that. In a lot of markets, you don't. So you're definitely feeling the tailwinds as opposed to the headwinds now. <laughs> yes, so yes, we'll it's nice, it's nice. So we're, we're about you know, down to the last few minutes of our program, and I want to pose the question to each of you about the news um, that North Carolina Department of Commerce is interested in setting up a public-private partnership here in the economic uh, development mm -hmm. arena for recruiting jobs. So you know, give me your 20, 30-second mm -hmm. take on uh, what this means to you, and I get to save Ronnie for the last. So Clark, start us off. Well, uh, it's a new venture for them. I don't know a lot about it other than what I read in the, in the press. Um, I know some other states have done it. Florida, I think Oregon had done it at one time. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, um, it's set up the same way that, that we are in some other states where we also take in private money that is used for certain things. So we, we do mix private and public money in our organization, although we're not considered a nonprofit or or a private group, but you know, you know, it's uh, it's an experiment, and we'll see if it, it works, and uh, you know, hopefully, it won't uh, work too well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's your take on this? I, I, I've had I've had my nose down in in, the, in my business, so I, I don't know. I, I do know this. Uh, you know, today, oddly enough, the Panama Canal opened in 1914. Wow. How how much has trade changed yeah. since then? Um, we are excited about our relationship with Colombia. Uh, we're ready to take on the other uh, areas of the world, and, and, and we're going to continue to try and create some real high-quality jobs here in the Carolinas. And, and, and we and thank you. We, well, we thank everybody who's helping <laughs> us make it happen. you got about 10 seconds. I work for an entrepreneurial agency. I think that if you can uh, structure any government agency in a way that it operates and uh, uh, like a business, it probably is a move in the right direction because your counterparty is a business person. Ronnie, you get one word. One word. 
I think it's an opportunity to be more nimble, an opportunity to be more flexible, operating as a business, and take some of the bureaucratic um, slowness that's generated from slow de decision making. That was a very productive. long word. <laughs> Just strings on. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.